I'm Katy Perry. And I'm Austin Hinkwitz, and this is After Earnings, the show from Morning Brew and Stakeholder Labs that brings investors up close and personal with the executives behind the world's most interesting companies. And today we're talking with Daniel Borrell. He is the co-founder and CEO of Re Automotive. They're building commercial EV products and services for the small to mid-sized trucking industry. And he describes Re as a completer, not a competitor, because essentially what they're doing is building modular commercial EV systems that can be white labeled by other manufacturers. We also got into some of the nuances between commercial and passenger EV. So if you're investing in that space, you're definitely gonna wanna listen to that part. And this interview was an interesting one because Daniel's company, Re Automotive, again, is not only building this sort of white labeled drive by wire technology for other OEM manufacturers, but he took the tech to go build his own mid sized commercial trucks. We spent some time digging into their three year plan on how they want to generate a billion in sales by the end of 2026. Little side note, they are pre revenue at the moment. But we also talked about Daniel's leadership style as well as his own daily driver. Spoiler alert, it's not what you'd expect. So uh, let's get into the interview. Daniel, thanks so much for hanging out with us and joining us on this episode of After Earnings. Thank you so much for having me. So let's jump into things, right? You are the CEO of Re Automotive. What is Re Automotive? What do you guys sell? Who do you sell it to? Why are they buying it? Just give me the whole breakdown of your company. So uh, Reason is an automotive tech company. We utilize uh, advanced software and hardware to modernize commercial vehicles industry by creator, creating a smarter electric trucks that are designed to deliver your, you know, greater efficiency, lower total cost of ownership and enhanced safety. Uh, I founded it together with my co-founder 10 years ago uh, with a vision of expediting and solidifying vehicle electrification through white label technology approach. Basically, we, we complete, we don't compete. And, and if you think about electrification 10 years ago, it was very much a question of if and not a question of when back then. And our core technology is what we call the recorner. It's an advanced by wire software and hardware mesh that packs uh, the core components of a vehicle, uh, steering, braking, suspension, powertrain, and control into a single and compact module positioned between the chassis and the wheel. This basically eliminates all the mechanical, all the legacy mechanical connection, enabling a pure software-driven vehicle. And the recorners, uh, the by wire technology, or as we call them, X by wire, um, it's been you know the fundamental technology and our key differentiator throughout you know many years. And and although many many have tried before, we are the first and currently the only one to have ever certified and deliver a full by wire vehicle. Um, and, you know, earlier this year on the heels of that certification, we also started to deliver uh, first vehicles to our customers. And the first product is called the P7C and it's a medium duty truck, electric truck. Um, so last to mid my deliveries, the UPSs of the world uh, and, and others. Um, um, market-wise, uh, we, we're concentrating on the medium-duty segment, so it's uh, about 200,000 new trucks a year. And if you look at that specific market, uh, it has uh, that specific segment, it, it, it has very mature charging infrastructure, very lucrative federal and state incentives. And that basically makes that segment of the market the fastest, the strongest growing EV segment in the industry. And we actually expect so, it to continue growing going forward. So just to um, jump in here, um, you're saying that you sell two products. One, the PC7, which is like this mid-sized truck, things like you know the Amazon delivery truck or the UPS, like things like that, right? And then you also sell sort of this like modular drive-by wire unit that you then like upfit into existing trucks. That, that's a great, great question. So think about us as Intel inside or auto. So the goal in the next few years is that every truck manufacturer 
would be using our buy wire corners. But in order to kickstart this market and supply this, the, the strong demand we see today, we're not waiting for those OEMs to come in. So we're working with several OEMs, some of them for years now, in, a, in, in adopting technologies and, and allowing them to use ours, like in that example of Intel, to have a Dell, a Novo H, or any other brand with Intel inside, or the, the sticker we know. Um, so essentially, the, the key differentiator is the, the BioWire technologies, the recorders. But we also currently selling in the market the first ever powered by re truck, which is ours, which is called the P7C. And P7C, Dan sorry, I misspoke there. Okay, that makes a ton of sense. Thanks for breaking that down. And Daniel, you touched on something I think is important to call out for the listeners, and that is some of the nuances between commercial EV and passenger EV when it comes to companies like yours and people building in the space. Um, I want to kind of... I would love to hear your voiceover on why the the mid-sized truck, I think it, it's the class three to six, I want to say, is that correct? Three to five, Three yes. to five. Um, what specifically about how those types of dealers and trucks operate makes them the most ripe for commercial EV, specifically when it comes to the infrastructure of EV, including charging? Well, that's a really good one because a lot of people don't differentiate between one commercial vehicle and passenger vehicle and of course the breakdown within those segments um so first and foremost these markets are completely uncorrelated so with although we see some slowdown in the passenger vehicle segment of the elect of the evs uh, mainly around saturation and 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 you know uh, quite strong adaptation of the past few years, the commercial segment is just starting and the demand is really, really strong. For many, two, maybe three reasons. One, at the end of the day, regulations. Uh, many government, including the US, but everywhere around the world have been very clear in, in, in carbon emission goals and the ability to put uh, uh, ice, internal combustion engine, ice vehicles on those roads. And by somewhere between 2030 and, and 2035, you won't be able to do that. And we saw the latest, just a week ago, the latest EPA uh, uh, um, uh, update on those emission goals. Um, that's one. Second, um, at the end of the day, when it comes to commercial trucks, TCO, total cost of ownership, is what makes the decisions. It's not just the acquisition cost, right? Because think about it, what, what, is it a good deal if I'll give you a truck that costs a third, but breaks down five times more? Not sure, right? So you, the industry this calculates it according to TC. You take the acquisition cost, the residual value, the maintenance, the support, the cost per mile, et cetera, et cetera. And you come up with a number and you can compare apples to apples. And EVs in general drive TCO down and our trucks, of the, the by wire trucks, powered by rig, drive it even further down, making one of the best uh, TCO operated out there. And, and this is very important for that industry because at the end of the day, these are work trucks. They need to make a buck for their owners, right? Right. And, and third, which is temporary, we, we can't count on that, is there they are very uh, uh, strong incentives in that segment. So if you look at it, Tesla's segment, for example, you can get between five to seven thousand dollars back when you buy an EV. In our segment, three to five, you can get up to a hundred and ten thousand dollar back on about a hundred and fifty thousand dollar truck. So it's actually cost you after after the rebate about half of a diesel one. Got it. So those incentives are designed to create some parity at the beginning, reduce some friction yes. to switching. Um, interesting. Thanks for breaking that down. Of course. Now oh, imagine. And, and by the way, one more thing about that is uh, range. That specific segment is not the long haul, right? It's not the, 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 the 500, 900 miles, coast to coast, et cetera, where range anxiety or charging infrastructure these trucks go 150 200 miles a day and that's easily achieved today with today battery technology and also the charging infrastructure within the depots is mature enough 
Right. It's, it's an important point. And that, that last mile thing. is there's a depot and there's planned routes and it's very controlled how far they're going. And so it's really a matter of does that depot have petrol or does it have a charger? And either way, it works similarly. Correct. Got it. Sort of coming back to this idea of like incentives. I mean, I think I saw that you guys are working now with 66 different dealers to help get the word out. You have an order book of about $50 million. Um, you're essentially though still pre-revenue, but nine months ago, you laid out this sort of three-year plan to deliver a billion in cumulative sales through 2026. So according to that plan, you should be delivering a few hundred vehicles by the end of this year. What's the update on the plan? So, so the simple update is that we're on track on the plan we laid out. That's the simple answer. Um, as you mentioned, we're targeting to sell about cumulatively about 6,000 trucks in the next three years, um, which is roughly 1% of the market. That's all. And, and if you, you just, you know, 6,000 trucks multiplied by just over $150,000 per truck, you get to the billion that you mentioned. So, um, so that's one, um, speaking about where we are. So, you know, 2023 was really a pivotal year for us at RE. We, we achieved very important key milestones in line with our original timelines and, and, and basically de-risk the go forward path. And it allows us to advance the state of the art in the medium duty commercial vehicle space by orders of, of magnitude, uh, compared to other offering, both EVs and, and ICE, like we talked about. Um, Basically, if, if if you look at our latest shareholder letter that we, we released a couple of weeks ago, uh, you'll see that much of the heavy lifting is is behind us on this path to commercialization. Right, uh, our technology is mature, tested, uh, and powered by rear vehicle are certified. Uh, we're the first to have FMVSS, EPA, and CARB uh, out there, and that gives us the the, the, the incentives. Um, and the order book that you mentioned uh, is driven by the strong demand we see from leading uh, fleets and, and, and dealers. Uh, and we actually grew our order book by more than 900% from the beginning of the year till today, reaching more than $50 million, which is a sub very sub substantial amount for a commercial vehicle fleet or EVs. Um, and, and that represents a few hundreds of trucks powered by RE, which is important because this is what we need to get to the positive unit economics that makes us so so unique. Now, it, it, we have sixty more. We have now about sixty six points of sales and service across the U.S. and Canada, which makes it probably uh, one of the largest pure EV service networks out there in the commercial segment, that, that's huge. And think about those dealers. We, our dealer network is servicing the largest and the smallest fleets you can think of. Some of them are huge and some of them are small, but at the end of the day, more than 70% of all trucks in that segment are going through dealers and they've been doing this for, for, for decades, right? And, and I think that um, the important start, thing that we're doing now is we're, we kicked off a demo program that we're giving, we're uh, giving, uh, uh, selling actually uh, uh, trucks to our uh, dealers. Those dealers get to show them to the fleet customers, the fleet customer experience the tech, experience the benefits, and putting the following orders for 2025, 2026 to get to the 6,000 to the 1%, which from what we see now, uh, we believe this demo program will have a flywheel effect on orders as more and more and more fleets get to test it, try it out, and, and experience the benefits. I, I caught your articulation of uh, comparison to tech versus auto. And one thing I think that's interesting in tech is this idea of switching costs. When a new tech comes along, even if there's price parity, <laughs> there's sometimes a little bit of pain associated. It could be pain in terms of um, changing internal people working on it, different skills required. And I, it feels like part of the success of your go-to-market really hinges on how to reduce this friction. And I would love to just hear about the sales process. Somebody demos 
uh, one of the the automobiles. They love it. What what then? And it seems it seems like an interesting challenge, right? Because this is an investment in the future to reduce costs in the future. Um, what what kind of goes into getting people to think about switching? And what are your plans to convince them uh, to convert once they once they have the demo under their belt? Yeah. Uh, well, first it actually starts way before then, right? Because. What makes us really unique in the industry is that, you know, um, I think we're the mirror image of what Henry Ford Sr. used to said many, many years ago that on Model T that you can get it in any color you want as long as it's black. Basically saying there is there's one model, you can have it or you can't or you don't, right? Uh, we are very, very much attuned to the voice of the customer. We actually build this truck together with leading fleets. There's been, we, we bring the tech methodology of the design partner. We have been working for years with leading fleets, global fleets, in, in designing that truck, listening very carefully to what's important. Because when you bring a commercial vehicle in, you have to justify every bit of it dollar-wise. I'll give an example. We have four motors, one in each corner. So usually, traditionally, fleets will say, no, we'll just have one or two and we'll save a couple of hundreds of dollars on, on cost. And you have to show them that actually by having four motors, you have more regen, regenerative energy. You can regen more, you spend less energy, you need less batteries, batteries are very expensive, you have more payload, and the math shows it's actually better. And, and you start there. And then, or, or for example, our, 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 our driver-centric cabin, one of the biggest hurdles in last mile today is drivers. And fleets are trying to get better vehicles to a, attract drivers to sign in with them. And we have a very, very driver-centric cabin. So all of those come together, and then we bring it to the market, right? You certify it, you test it, you certify it's there. And then you start the sale process. And, and, and this is where we're, you can go both ways. Uh, sorry, in either of two ways, not, not both. One, you can do the, the, the direct approach like Tesla, that they sell direct, or you go through the dealers. We decided to go through dealers, mainly because of the reason that they're so good in what they do. So basically, the thing they've already forgotten, we have not yet learned, if we're honest. Yep. And the relationship that they have with those fleets go decades back. So they basically call up their fleets that they've been buying trucks from them for years, say, hey, we've got something new for you to try out. And they come in or they go to them, they try it out for a day or two, a week or a couple of weeks, put it in day-to-day -day usage. And then when they like it, they put in the orders for the next batch and the next batch. Uh, and before we take those orders, we make sure they understand what it means to charge them, if they have the right infrastructure and, and, and so on and so forth. That's second and third and probably i would say the most important of them all is service you cannot sell a truck a commercial vehicle without the ability to service it it's 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 impossible and this is why the 66 points of sales and service that we have the, the, the probably the largest one in north america for pure reviews is so essential because if something happens, they drop in at one of those stations, if they can't do it themselves, and we get them back on the road. Real quick, what does service look like for a commercial EV versus uh, a traditional commercial vehicle? Like, are there the mechanics that are servicing these commercial vehicles now, how do they compare and contrast to whoever's uh, working on these in the future if they're EV? Oh, is it like more of like one. a software so, background focus you need almost more than a mechanical training or like what is that? Is that a very different profile of worker that's actually manning those places? So, so traditionally, when it was, you know, when it's diesel, you either hammer things into place or you have to have a very or basically you have a very big uh, uh, inventory that you have to hold because it's if, if you're missing one part. The vehicle is decommissioned or it's on a lift for a few days and, and it's not making money. And, and that's a big issue, right? So you have to have 
a very big inventory of spare parts, whether if you serve them yourself at your depot or at the dealer. EVs have significantly less moving parts, therefore are less prone to break down. And, but you still have to service them. You still have to have spare parts and, and, and everything else. What's really cool about RE and our RE corners is that remember everything sits in that corner and it's a compact module. So that module, if something doesn't work, it's software driven. So 80% of cases we solve over the air. We just, just send the code and fix it like, like oh, wow. your Mac. Platform. But if something breaks and it's commercial vehicles, things break, right? Instead of three days on a lift trying to fix stuff and wait for parts, you basically can swap out and in a corner in less than one hour and get back on the world. Really similarly to an F1 pit stop. You come in, you put it on a small lift, unscrew the corner. Take it out. Bolt a new corner in. Now the corners are identical. Front and rear, left and right. It's the same corner. So you basically stock one part, which is a corner. Just bolt it in. It takes you about mechanically, physically, basically 20 minutes. And after that 20 minutes, it's in place. Then the system takes about another 40 minutes to recalibrate, safety checks, security, cyber updates, etc. And you're back on the road. And that's, that's gold for commercial trucks. So what you're saying is I could do it. <laughs> yes, Maybe not. We'll get into it, but I don't, no, I don't no, drive. No. So it would be amazing if I could, if I could have this job. But uh, thanks for that. That was really interesting. Now, before we jump into a couple more questions here about your leadership style, I'm sure a lot of retail investors listening right now would see that you guys just recently raised, I think it was $13 million worth with a public offering, additional $2 million uh, on top of that opportunity. So, you know, the opportunity to raise a total of $15 million here. 2023 was a pretty cash heavy year. You guys burnt 93 million. Uh, you've got 71 million more of cash in the bank, another 15 million in the form of a credit facility. What is the plan to stay solvent in 24, 25, and 26 as you deliver upon these, call it 6,000 vehicles without perpetually diluting existing shareholders? Or a question. Uh, I'll just maybe start by saying that we, we, we didn't burn through. I, I look at it more, we, we spend strategically, right? And, and now with the majority of the heavy lifting behind us at this point, um, we expect to be able to drive down our spend looking forward, right? So that's, that's one. Um, but listen, uh, we've been doing this for more than 10 years and we've, been, we've always been very disciplined in our cash spend and 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 being very disciplined in cash spend is one thing but it's a completely entire entirely different thing to do that while meeting your targets and that's what we've done in in 2023 when when what you mentioned earlier and and i think we did even more in 2023 because not only we met all of our milestones we did it while cutting cash flow by 25% year over year while meeting those, those milestones. So we are very, very, very disciplined. And we've always been. It's not just because of the recent macro uh, environment, right? Um, and, and I think that what being disciplined means is finding new ways to meet your targets in a more efficient way. Um, now, Listen, we are very confident in our market position, in our technological leadership, but we also recognize the challenging macroeconomic condition, right? It's quite obvious. And, and we're doing uh, what we can to combat these external forces, uh, including securing uh, funding with favorable terms. Uh, we, we secured about $24 million in the past few months in very favorable terms compared to, to others in the market. Um, and, and we're doing it because we are very mindful of shareholders' dilution. Um, and I think that's what's characterized us out there. Um, so we want to ensure operational efficiency while 
uh, being mindful of shareholder dilution. And, and you know, um, maybe lastly, I'll say that while others um, in the industry are, are burning through hundreds of millions of dollars or maybe billions for some, uh, our working capital needs going forward in, for producing our, our pipeline are, are very modest. We're talking about double digits of millions only uh, for the next couple of years when we, we, we ramp this up. And, and I think this is a very, very important differentiator for us in, in, in our industry. Um, I think that now with the, you know, the heavy lifting behind us, the tech proven, the investment that we already have done and made in, in, in the production of the corners, the plan that is the, 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 the recorner plan that is up and running, uh, with ample capacity and the, uh, growing order book. Um, I think we were, we were in good shape for, for success. Um, the only thing we need to do now is complete uh, the um, uh, working capital raise that we need. Uh, because as you mentioned, uh, we have enough money currently in, in the bank for daily operations. We want to make sure that we have enough to see the production through in the form of, of working capital. And once we secure the required working capital for the current order book, we'll go and produce. We will not do that before. To your point, I think it would be irresponsible on our part to start scale production without being able to see it through and putting our shareholder at risk because that would require us to potentially um, uh, look at highly dilutive funding because you will be between the, the, the hammer and, and the hard place, which the rock and the hard place, which makes no sense. So we want to make sure that we have all the working capital needs in advance and then kick off the serial production. I think it makes a ton of sense. And just for added clarity, when you say unfavorable macroeconomic uncertainty, what does that mean? I'm seeing record high, you know, stock market, GDP growth in 24 is going to be 3%, um, record low unemployment. So what are you alluding to when you say that? That if you take out the uh, MAG7, I think you'll see a different market. The uh, Magnificent 7, right? The, uh, the, the main different markets are, are different. Um, we've seen um, high interest levels that are not going down as fast as people have been thinking. Uh, we've seen uh, different um, risk appetites in, in recent quarters with investors. Um, and I think we need to recognize it as, 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 as a company. Uh, and we need to make sure that we are very, very, very disciplined in how not only we spend the cash that we have, but also how do we raise additional funding and what do we use that funding for? And we've been very, very open, I think very open with, with our, our shareholders in the market about what we need exactly and what we're going to do with them. Got it. So you're talking about it from like a liquidity perspective versus like a revenue generation or like order book perspective. You're saying the order book and like, you know, the underlying economy, like it's it's very healthy. You guys are seeing a big pipeline and you're really excited to deliver upon these 6,000 vehicles. But from a fundraising perspective, it's it's a little rocky, which I would agree with, obviously. obviously. Yeah. And, and, and I think. I think it's very important to recognize that investors especially retail investors, but not only, put significant funds into us and expect us to treat it with, with the utmost respect of, of their money, right? Because that's what funds us. And, and we, we do exactly that. And this is why we've been cutting costs year over year, right? Like by, by, by 25%. This is why we've been very uh, deliberate in making sure that we have all the working capital funding we need in order to go to market. So we've spent all the money that we needed on the development of the tech, the R&D, that's done, that's certified, that's behind us. We spend all the money we need on the production line in, of the corners, that's done. We spend all the CapEx tooling on those corners, that's done. What we need to do now is to um, um, 
raise the re- required working capital to bridge between when we order the parts to when we get we sell and get paid for the 50 million order book that we have. And once we have that, we'll go to produce. We'll complete the other parts of the tooling program that we have. We'll kick off a, 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 a contract manufacturer in the US to assemble the vehicle, of course. Uh, and, and, and then that's, we're off to the races, right? But I think that's the, the responsible approach to make sure that you can see it through especially in today's market. They don't come, come out short and say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm missing some funding, but now I have to take an unfriendly term or funding options. I think it makes a ton of sense. I appreciate the walkthrough. Yeah, and Daniel, I, I really- I hope it does. I, I appreciate you speaking directly to, to retail shareholders. And I noticed you, you've done AMAs on Reddit in the past. You've been- really appreciate you coming on here today and like breaking down all these things, because I think some leadership, you know, they put the investor deck out and they're like, figure it out. And as we've been going through, like, there's a lot of, a lot of nuances here. And so how do you feel about kind of your role as a CEO in helping demystify some of the nuances of business that might not come across in shorter form content? And is this something you plan to continue doing um, as the company journey continues? That, the simple answer is yes. I think this is of paramount importance. I, I mean, I'm very accessible either on AMA, on LinkedIn. I, 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 re, I make sure to personally reply to anybody who asks something or, or you know, messages me. And, 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 and of course, to the extent that we can, of course, we can share non-public material information, but for everything we can do better work in explaining or take advice or making sure that maybe something was not clear. That's not only mine, our entire leadership job to do. We also do that through the few trade shows that we take part of a part in. Uh, we did one a few weeks ago in Indianapolis. Next one is in Vegas in, in, in a few weeks time. And this is where we get the opportunity also to meet not only our peers in the industry and our suppliers and customers, but also many of our investors who come in and say, hey, I'm an investor, I had a question. And, and, and I think this relationship is super important because, I mean, let's be honest, we, we, we can't do what we do without our investors. As simple as that. They, they are part of what makes us who we are. Yeah, and it seems like similar to the way you're getting feedback from the dealers, from investors, those conversations might actually inform how you're describing certain parts of your business, certain um, aspects of your progress, because, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And having that direct communication could unlock some insight that might be able to help your positioning and going to market. Absolutely. I mean, one good example for that, that if if you take a look at our latest shareholder letter uh, from a few weeks ago, we literally did a check the box exercise for each of the division, right? We did, hey, this is what we promised you we're going to do. Check, 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 check. And that's what's left for us to do. So we also laid out what's coming to make sure that everybody understands what we're concentrating on. And we did it across, you know, tech, operational, business, and finance. And we've been very, I hope that we've been very, very clear to saying, hey, this is what we promised you we're going to do. And this is what we did. And this is what we have like, yet to do, and we're on it. And, and I think this is important for everybody, of course, the institutional investors, but also the retail, because we want to make sure that we communicate what we're doing as clearly as, as we possibly can. Yeah, that makes totally a lot agree. of sense. And sort of to linger on this um, kind of questioning around the leadership style, right? I would argue, I mean, to your point, you guys have been around 10 years. I mean, you guys have been here and I'm sure you still have some early employees that have stuck around and, you know, they're excited to see this get across the finish line. So talk to me a little bit about how you keep employee morale so high, how you keep driving home the mission of the company and how you just keep things moving up and to the right internally. Oh, wow. Um, Really simply, we are the flattest organization, I think, on the planet. Flatter than a pancake, I think. There is no hierarchy. (laughs) Everybody can, can and should have a say. We hire only the best. 
it's very, very difficult to get accepted, Edry. And we, we make sure that if you're on board, you get the resources, capability, responsibility to do what you think is right. Nobody's going to tell you what you need to do. You need to tell everybody what you think we should be doing. And everybody has a voice. So everybody sits in one big open space everywhere around the world. It's very friendly. Everybody, can, we form ad hoc teams all the time and we break them and form different ones according to what we need. And in almost all cases, I mean, the best idea in the room, the smartest idea in the room, hopefully wins. There, there, there's no hierarchy. So that's, that's one. Um, and, and two, as I said, we, we hire only the best, literally only the best. That, that's, I know everybody says that, but a hey, team re is the best team I've ever, ever had the privilege of working with. And, and, and we are one team. That's how we work. We are one team and, and, and we make sure that we work really hard, but we also appreciate the time together. We make sure that we enjoy the ride as much as we can. Some days are not that fun, right? But, but most days, um, and, and we make sure that we communicate internally, basically as flat as we can. There is that, um, we are very, very data focused. So if, if you come in and say, Hey, I feel that a, B and C, then that's a little bit tricky because feeling is less, you know, we, we don't know what to do with those feelings. At least not at work. But if you can show numbers around what you think and those number hold done, that's yours. Go execute. And, and this what I think allows us to, to be the first to, to certify full by wire vehicle. Many have tried for years for, for, 30 something years, people have been trying to do by wire vehicles. I mean, planes fly by wire for 50 years, but think about it. A pilot is a very, very, very trained professional. And usually that you need two to figure out stuff. So we needed to take that tech and bring it to auto where everybody, everybody could drive it. Right. Um, and, 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 and even you, Katie, right. Everybody can drive it. I, I drive it. <laughs> even and, Katie Perry. And, and, yeah. And, and, and and by the way, you should definitely. I was going to say, is that a challenge? Can I? Can we yeah. get this teed up? Done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you, are, I'm assuming go. the vehicle's insured and it's all good there, just in case. Yes. All right. Yeah, but you won't need it because it's the safest out there. Amazing. You know, our next we, episode we with Daniel is going to take place in a P7C. <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> I'll take you on that. Amazing. Hey, we ran two consecutive. Winter test, right? And we tested those in the uh, Arctic Circle in minus negative 30, 30 degrees. degrees Celsius. Yes, and, and Fahrenheit, right? It's more or less the same. And 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 one of the tests we tried to do with the by wire is to oversteer it. We drove over a completely frozen lake, right? Zero traction, and you try to oversteer. As disappointing as it might be, it just won't oversteer because the by wire keeps you safe, right? You have all wheel steer, all wheel brake, all wheel drive, so many redundancies. The computer oversees everything. And, and this is real time. So I love it. Well, done. speaking of, you know, driving and oversteering, um, Katie obviously lives in New York, so she's not driving too much, but I drive a fifth gen Toyota 4Runner. When you're not driving the P7C, where are you driving? What's your daily driver, Daniel? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm driving a tiny electric Fiat 500 convertible very cool very, very cool, cool. And, and i love it i absolutely love it that's um, awesome and also yeah. uh looked at your twitter before this because that's what i do um saw you had some peloton content so gotta ask when you're not driving and you're riding who's your favorite peloton instructor that's a good one so uh, I, that's a good question. So, oh, I have it's to get hard. back it's to you on that because it is a hard question. It is a hard question. And, and, um, 
You know, I, where was it? I think I was in. I said, yeah, I was in the UK in an airport in a connection. And I was sitting in the lounge and suddenly I see somewhere in the corner, a Peloton bike. And I say, hey guys, do you happen to have showers? They go like, yeah, sure. So thank you, book me one. And I went out in the middle of the airport, took it to the side and, and had a great workout and, and linked my way back to the airplane. A That's couple amazing. Of hours later. I've never seen yeah, that, that was, in the U.S. I think somebody just left it there. Oh. I, I'm not I'm not 100% sure it was supposed, you know, it's part of the, the venue, but it was a lot of fun. That, I, Daniel, I would have done the same exact thing. I might have missed my flight. <laughs> so I'm right there with you. If it's just sitting there, might yeah. as well, you know? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Absolutely. Daniel. What a great conversation, man. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of After Earning. And hopefully the retail investors listening right now not just learned about the awesome trucks you're creating, but the pioneering you're doing with drive-by wire. I mean, to your point, right? First commercial use case here. So really, really exciting to have this conversation with you, man. And hopefully we'll see you again pretty soon. Looking forward to it. And thank you so much. It was so much fun. Daniel, what a guy. What an awesome interview. And heck, I learned so much about Real Automotive. I mean, I kind of knew what they did, but like after that conversation, I feel like I'm dialed in. Yeah, I feel like I'm a commercial EV expert almost. I got to say my favorite part was Daniel telling me I could both fix and drive one of their commercial <laughs> EV trucks. So me and my unused New York license plate are ready for that. He promises it's insured. So we're good to go. Um, whenever he's ready, we are. And we'll be sure to, to stream that here if we can. But more importantly, I was really interested to dig in with him on the go-to-market strategy. He's switching dealerships and fleets over from uh, the tradi traditional trucking setup they have to EV. And there's obviously a lot of points of friction there. There's a business case in the long term to reducing costs over time with EV. But that doesn't come without some sort of pain in the interim in terms of different ways of handling maintenance and charging ports and infrastructure. And so it was really interesting to hear from him how they're working closely with dealers on the ground as they bring these things to market, because really that conversion is going to make it or break it for them when it comes to fulfilling their plans. Um, and I also thought at the end, he was really transparent and talked about a lot about why speaking to retail shareholders is so important, as you alluded to. This is a very complex industry to be in. There's regulatory considerations. Uh, there's there's specificity around the auto industry, around tech, around EV. And so it is a, a more complex story to tell investors. And so I think he recognizes that having more conversations with retail investors is going to benefit him with that audience in the long run. Um, for you, yeah. Austin, what what stood out? Yeah, I totally agree. I think, you know, something that he mentioned that was really cool was he's like, listen, guys, this isn't a truck that's going to drive 900 miles, right? We are not the 18 wheeler. We are the truck that's going to deliver your Amazon package or like the, the UPS truck, right? These are have a very clear route every single day. It's 80 miles, 100 miles, 150 miles. And that's what we're building for. And I thought that's really cool, right? Understanding exactly what you are building for and towards so that you can build the best product possible. An interesting interview, to say the least. Um, you know, I think this whole company comes down to their ability to really deliver upon this $50 million order book, right? They're aiming to deliver 300 vehicles by the end of 2024. They've sort of already sold those vehicles to dealers and other customers, but now they're now like trying to figure out how do we raise the money to actually go about building them and making sure we can, you know, start making money as a company. And that's the real story with this stock, in my opinion, right? If they can raise the additional capital, allowing them to manufacture and deliver those 300 vehicles, then they're break even and they're off to the races. That puts them well on their path to generate that billion dollars in sales by the end of 2026. If they can't uh, raise the funds needed, then they're toast or would have to dilute their existing shareholders even more. So it's really up to you as the retail investor to believe that they can accomplish this feat of raising more money, uh, which I hope they do. I hope they get it. I hope they generate the billion in sales and I hope they prove everyone, including the stock market, completely wrong. But that's that's the real story here, right? Will they raise? Will they be able to deliver these vehicles and break even? And then it's just off to the races or is you know time working against them? Um, who knows? But nonetheless, I learned a lot and I thought it was an awesome conversation. 
Totally, and as a reminder, that billion's going to come from what Daniel described as 1% of total new commercial mid-truck sales. That's, in his words, that's all they need between now and 2026 to hit that billion dollar mark. Um, and they got the 100K in tax incentives in some markets and states working for them where uh, essentially some of these potential customers are getting heavy, heavy uh, discounts in the form of, of EV credits for, for moving in this direction. So something's working in their direction. Really interested to hear from Daniel in the future and get an update on the plan as time goes on. And with that being said, I'm Katy Perry. And I'm Austin Hankwitz. And this was the After Earnings Podcast brought to you by Stakeholder Labs and Morning Brew. Be sure to like, subscribe, and don't forget to share this episode with a friend if you learned something. And we will catch you on our next episode.